Hello and, and welcome everybody to yet another OpenShift Commons briefing. And this time I'm really pleased to have um, this uh, reference architecture being talked about. Um, I've talked about it a lot um, coming from Dell of running OpenShift on OpenStack um, and Dell Meltland, um, who's been a longtime OpenShift fan and a good friend of the OpenStack community and worked on lots of stuff um, with us from heat templates to unbelievably think strange things um, and made them all work for us. Um, and Judd's um, been doing a lot of work making sure that OpenShift runs on OpenStack um, and on the Dell release. So I'm going to let Judd introduce himself. He's going to talk for 20, 30 minutes, demo some stuff. You can ask questions in the chat, um, and we will try and answer them through via chat. But after he's done, we're going to have a Q&A and do more chat questions. Um, but I'll also open up the microphone so we can have a conversation as well. So without further ado, I'm going to let Judd introduce himself. Hi, everybody. I'm Judd Malton, um, Systems Principal Engineer at Dell. Um, we Dell's a very big place, 100,000 employees, uh, and merging with EMC, so things are about to get even stranger. Um, we have an enterprise services group, our inter I'm sorry, enterprise systems group. Um, the head of our enterprise systems group um, spoke at Red Hat Summit and touted this particular solution uh, on top of uh, Red Hat's uh, OSP OpenStack platform. Um, We've been collaborating with Red Hat on the OpenStack platform for three years now. Um, and what we do is we, we build up a hardware reference architecture. We deploy OSP on it in all of its beta releases, uh, communicate very closely on a daily basis with Red Hat, sending bugs upstream or committing directly to OpenStack to uh, get things fixed up so it weren't, runs great on our hardware. It makes it super easy for our customers uh, to order up a small, medium, or large size uh, OpenStack uh, cluster. And what I've been tasked to do, I am the lone resource who is doing PaaS and containers uh, on our particular version, our particular release of um, OSP. We, we are actually not distributing the software. Software all comes from Red Hat. Uh, we are just distributing the, the documentation and a little bit of the uh, open source code for some of the automation we've done to make it really easy to just get the Dell gear up and running and OpenStack deployed. It's been my job to um, automate the deployment, automate test and uh, deliver the deployment of OpenShift and cloud forms to make even OpenShift more valuable on, uh, on this OpenStack platform. So a little bit about me. Um, I started a long time ago as a sysadmin and a Perl developer, did a lot of um, uh, work in web dev and administration in mid-sized MSPs. I uh, did video delivery. I did the first online shopping cart in the Middle East when I was living in Israel doing graduate work. Um, and uh, as an SA and Perl developer um, back in 2007, did a really interesting virtual world uh, deployment on open, on, sorry, on um, Second Life uh, and automated by hand uh, 200 EC2 instances for, uh, for a television tie-in feature that we did that lasted for a night. Uh, then I did 10 years of identity management work with the likes of Netscape, the New York Stock Exchange, uh, and some local uh, and international consulting companies. And in the last 10 years, I've been doing just DevOps before DevOps was a thing. At the New York Stock Exchange, I saw the most resilient infrastructure I, had, I could ever imagine and the most strict and reliable operations procedures uh, you could really ever imagine. And I said, there has to be an automated way to do this. And so back in 2003, I started uh, with CF Engine and followed the whole world of, uh, of infrastructure automation up until today, where now I'm focused on cloud and containers and paths and automating that infrastructure. Um, I came to Dell to work on the Crowbar project, which has since spun out of Dell and their... Um, based their own business on it, and have renamed it Digital Rebar. Um, so let's talk about OpenShift. Uh, no more talking about all this past. Uh, the things I want to cover 
in this presentation are, why are we running OpenShift on OpenStack anyway? Why not run OpenShift on bare metal? Um, why run it on any infrastructure as a service? Second section we talk about is uh, our own validated, some of the details on our validated OpenStack platform, our reference architecture, and the deltas between what we've deployed uh, and what we constantly deploy and redeploy uh, in testing at Dell and what you need to get OpenShift up and running and, uh, and scale OpenShift. Um, which leads me to the next section, which is creating the technical guides. Um, we produce three technical guides for OpenShift on OpenStack. Um, one focused only on OpenShift. Uh, the, the second, uh, a cloud forms deployment guide. And the third guide would be is to integrate OpenShift and cloud forms together to get a really robust experience. Uh, and then finally, the, I'll talk briefly about um, how we're using, how we're integrating, how we're deploying and integrating cloud forms with, uh, with OpenShift and, and uh, finish up with a little walkthrough of what I've deployed and documented for managing the whole stack from the metal to the containers in, uh, in cloud forms. Um, so back to our initial question, why run OpenShift on OpenStack? First thing, most places have some sort of OpenStack investment and they've gone through the radical transformation of from, from brick and mortar to cloud, basically, whether it's an on-premise cloud or they're buying their OpenStack from somebody as a service, they have made the intellectual leap and the business leap into uh, a cloud way of thinking about resources. Um, the folks who've done it on-premise um, will enjoy commingling container and VM-based applications. If they're doing network function virtualization, also that technology itself is, is rather new, but very useful, especially for telcos, network providers. Um, people are putting firewalls in virtual machines, uh, routers, switches, doing all that stuff within uh, VM and then packet inspection in VMs. That investment um, is living, are living in virtual machines, living on OpenStack. Uh, great that our container, containers would have access to them and close access to them if they're all on the same uh, infrastructure as a service. Um, if you put your OpenShift on top of OpenStack, you get a full stack multi-tenancy where um, your authentication services for and your uh, resource isolation is happening uh, throughout the entire stack. Um, and you can leverage whatever existing multi-tenancy you have in place. Um, also for self-service, if you've already set up um, divisions of your company or your partners to be able to deploy resources in your infrastructure through OpenStack, uh, this just continues that paradigm and makes things easier for you. Um, I see the biggest win in the um, in a second to last bullet point where you're taking advantage of existing operational procedures. Um, operations is the heart of your organization. Without that, you can't uh, we're not in business anymore. And people of generally corporations, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, uh, when operations fails, their entire business goes down. And so the investment you put into the operational procedures around your cloud, around your infrastructure and your virtual machines um, is nothing you want to pivot away from very quickly if you're going to pivot away from it at all. Um, especially features like um, uh, workload migration, um, snapshotting, and especially disaster recovery. Uh, those are probably well tried and true tested in, in your organization and don't give that up. Layer OpenShift on top of that and uh, you'll be able, you'll, you'll have the same recovery that you had in the previous instance or very similar. And also in interacting with uh, vendors like Dell, you're going to continue the similar purchasing patterns. Uh, it's, it makes it easier for everybody if when an architecture is defined and a bill of materials is well-defined, that it makes it 
um, a lot easier to order and a lot more predictable to order. So when gear arrives on your loading dock, it's actually what you expect and your operators and your data center managers are able to put together gear that you're familiar with. And you've already done all the work for OpenStack. There's almost no stretch at all to do it with OpenShift. Um, the, so now I want to talk about the, the details of our reference architecture and how they compare to the requirements of OpenShift. Uh, and what I had to do. So we'll talk about the sizing goals of our reference of Dell's reference architecture of, of OpenStack and those deltas, how we scale our reference architecture and some of the uh, and how we promise HA um, and some of the flexible hardware details. Uh, I'll get into a little bit of the security issues and then review um, those three documents that I produced for you. Uh, in order to make this stuff happen. First of all, our architecture goal when looking at virtual machines, our minimum configuration uh, was to have something that was scalable and flexible. That is flexible if you wanted more storage than compute, or you wanted more compute than storage, you'd be able to easily uh, size that and order it from us with really a minimum of hassle. Uh, we have a bill of materials guide that gets you everything that we've tested a million times and we actually do our ordering for, for our little team within Dell. We don't do, we don't order our gear through Dell's internal ordering system. We use the same ordering system that any of our customers do. So we know exactly what kind of customer experience you're going to have with Dell when you use our RA. We try to make it as easy as possible for you. So we figured our base virtual machine would be two cores of four gigs of RAM with 40 gigabytes of local ephemeral storage. And that's what we sized it off of. Uh, we did then we did a lot of work validating our storage solutions, the Equal Logic backend, the um, Dell Storage Center, which used to be called Compellent backend, um, and we wrote drivers for OpenStack. Uh, did a lot of work on Cinder, and all of that is upstream in OpenStack. And all of it is available thanks to Kubernetes um, implementation of a, of a Cinder driver. Um, being able to mount cinder volumes is available within OpenShift. Yay. Um, we also looked very closely at the networking. Um, there will be even more network traffic with OpenShift um, with containers uh, talking to each other in Kubernetes in order to keep things alive. Um, so we have uh, at the bottom, the last line there is, uh, is our basic um, switch configuration. And uh, here on the next slide, uh, I detail a little bit how that minimal storage plays out. Um, you're doing one solution admin host, which has your OpenStack director, your, your, your Ceph front end, and your Tempest testing virtual machine. So we, we're giving you the opportunity uh, and the capabilities to test and retest uh, your OpenStack deployment um, when you deploy it. You, there's no second step that you need to take to test your uh, what you've deployed when you use our reference architecture. Um, we're deploying three controllers, three compute nodes. You, you have your choice of, of three different chassis if you want to port, put more NICs in the box and uh, the three major storage options. The, the R730XD is really just a, a nice 2U, just jammed with drives, and you, you would normally run Ceph on top of that and have just plenty of storage space. Uh, if you have the operations folks for it, you have an investment in Compellent or Equal Logic, uh, we totally support it. Um, and then this is how we scale up. From three compute nodes, we've tested in our first rack. Um, eight compute nodes um, or seven storage nodes. And you can also mix, mat, mix and match and get four computes and three storage if you just want to scale up that first rack. Or you can go to three racks and just end up with tons and tons of compute and RAM uh, and mix and match the storage as you like. If you're going to have a lot of network throughput, we also indicate this, um, the first line on the left under network, the Z9100 switch can really handle very high uh, data rates that you might have depending on uh, how you'll be using. If you're using a lot of NFV, um, you'll probably want to use the Z9100 switch. I 
in your central rack. Um, so I looked at what our minimum configuration was and what it was offering us and how many um, how this would translate into OpenShift terminology. Um, so Red Hat recommends our each master VM have a minimum of two virtual CPUs plus one CPU per every additional thousand pods, eight gigs of RAM, another 2.5 gigs of RAM per thousand pods, and uh, 30 gigs of storage. Um, that compares to, and, and the nodes, uh, I don't really have to read all this off, but really what you end up with um, is, uh, well, what you've purchased, if you purchase the minimum, is over here on the right, you have a physical solution of 72 cores available to you in 348 gigs of RAM, making about approximately 5 gigs of RAM, a little more per core. Um, the in an oversubscribed in, in a non-oversubscribed situation where you're really using, you're giving every node, every pod, one-to-one -one virtual CPUs, uh, you can deploy 14 instances of four CPUs. So you would have, um, of the 56 cores available, you could have probably make, probably create um, 14 instances, virtual machine instances with the OpenShift node running on it and then you probably if you really want to maximize your um available performance for each of the nodes and for each of your pods you would just deploy four pods or maybe five pods per node uh it's if you're doing incredibly compute intensive work if you're not here on the next one let's compare subscription versus non-over subscription with over subscription um if you oversubscribe, oversubscribe our very base system with 72 cores, you would probably have up to 200 pods running um, in your system. So uh, that's the basics for you. Um, pivoting here a little bit, switching to a whole other subject. On the left column is what we are offering you um, as tested and validated in our labs on Red Hat's OpenStack platform. These are the OpenStack and OpenStack associated features um, that we're offering. Uh, we're doing the OSP director deployment. Everything is automated with Keystone and, and, and um, Keystone authentication and, and just the whole list of, uh, of typical uh, basic OpenStack features. For OpenShift, on the right column, these are the features that I had to enable, uh, grab some packages off of OSP um, that don't come out of the box for us. I had to add uh, the Neutron load balancer. So I had to reconfigure the controllers a little bit. Um, uh, also to support the heat cloud formations um, and the heat metadata service. As it, and I'll go into a little bit of the complexity of how OpenShift and OpenStack works. This metadata service um, provides data into Ansible and then to OpenShift to get OpenShift uh, um, set up properly. Here's the iChart network diagram. It's a complex network uh, to be able to support all of this storage, have an out-of-band management network, uh, provide the OpenStack API, provide uh, uh, floating IPs to OpenShift you know, or to more than one deployment of OpenShift and all the red stuff in the middle, those are the, the virtual machines that are running. Uh, there's cloud forms, there's the infrastructure node that's delivered by um, the, the open source project to deploy OpenShift. Uh, there's the, there's the uh, Neutron load balancer and then those Three on the right are the three master VMs, and then a whole other long red band, horizontal red band near the bottom, which are the the networks that are private to uh, the OpenShift deployment. And then down on the bottom are however many OpenShift nodes that you're going to be creating, and it's private network. Um, the security issues that I found as I embarked on this were first thing was the the divisions of concerns that we had set up on the previous slide by network suddenly had some holes in it when we tried to do full stack management with cloud forms 
Um, and the, the second issue that just jumped out at me was that there was no immediate keystone integration. It wasn't something that folks were, that Red Hat was testing in the OpenShift and OpenStack project. It was very much a work in progress. So in order to get the full stack, single identity, multi-tenancy, there still needs some, some work needs to happen in order to get that done. And that's one of my to-dos for my next release. What came out of this are these three very detailed, follow the directions and you'll get a solid deployment, two technical guides and an integration guide. One just for OpenShift on OpenStack, one just for CloudForms on OpenStack, and then a third to integrate CloudForms and OpenShift together on OpenStack. Here's what I really went through. Uh, discovered the project um, that was very nascent to build OpenShift on Open, OpenStack as heat templates uh, and bash scripts calling out the Ansible work. Um, discovered it about uh, eight months ago. Uh, saw that there were a bunch of feature deltas that would have to ha um, be addressed. Um, then I want to describe to you a little bit of my life deploying unfinished infrastructure software as a practice, because <laughs> um, I had to keep deploying this over and over again to address bugs, to, to test it for all of y'all. Um, OSP actually was not initially supported, um, and there were a few features that I had to add uh, in order to make it for the, the common customer outside of, of Red Hat to, to be able to uh, use their OSP licenses in addition to their OpenShift licenses. And then if we have time, I can dig into some of the how you go about debugging uh, and coordinating the, the deep layers of many technologies that are used to deploy all this stuff. Um, so what is this project? Uh, the project is um, very well coordinated. Heat templates, bash scripts, Ansible modules, custom Ansible modules, and YAML configs. Um, those all work together in order to do the steps in these two columns. Uh, first, heat creates um, the, the networks necessary, the security groups, et cetera, et cetera, within OpenStack, uh, creates the alarms and Solometer, um, and then first deploys the infra server. Now, the infrastructure server is not a part of OpenShift. It's something that this team has created in order to provide secondary services, um, such as DNS such as the, the host to uh, kick off all the Ansible runs in order to deploy OpenShift and configure the cluster on all these nodes. Uh, so then he goes ahead and deploys the master VMs and runs the cloud init scripts to set up the master VM boxes. Then it deploys the nodes uh, and then gets them started and then deploys the load balancer and checks that all of that network connect connectivity is working. Then it goes ahead and does the Ansible runs, the right column, uh, off of that infrastructure server, uh, that infrastructure VM. And so it deploys the OpenShift masters and nodes, and then can deploy an OpenShift router and an OpenShift registry if you so choose. The, um, uh, I found to the, the changes I had to make on my OpenStack were that it was actually quite easy to enable uh, heat cloud formations and the heat metadata server didn't have much trouble there, but it was uh, there was a, a little bit of um, a, a delta off of our published uh, OpenStack deployment guide. Also, load balancing as a service was pretty easy to configure, just a delta off of our configuration guide. Um, where things got more interesting were uh, that uh, the DNS server that's deployed also needed access to our corporate LAN. Um, and there, I had to add a bunch of names, uh, enable um, zone transfer uh, in order to allow our DNS servers to pick up what was going on in, in this bind uh, server running on the infrastructure server, um, especially so I could use cloud forms to, open, to access the OpenShift uh, features, OpenShift uh, services by name. Um, and finally, and the most complex part, which I really won't dig into too much here, is that I was, as I was doing these deployments over and over again, I saw that the default SDN that comes with OpenShift, which is the Open vSwitch one, did indeed have the de-encapsulation, re-encapsulation performance bottleneck. So I switched uh, our deployment over to Flannel 
and it worked really well and the performance was really great. In a future uh, release of this, I'm planning on handing it over to our uh, within Dell, we have really an amazing performance manager, performance testing team, and Red Hat's been putting together a lot of uh, tools to do performance testing of OpenShift and containers in general. And I'm going to act as the interface between those two groups to get um, get our performance team able to uh, really run OpenShift very hard in performance testing. Um, here's a little tip: just you're going to be if you're using this to, to test out and you're developing along with us to make this a great product, uh, the meaningful stack names becomes really important. Um, so this is a little script I put together to um, just create stacks that were had unique names um, and that I could update over and over again. Um, the uh, <clears throat> I was doing parallel multiple simultaneous deployments of OpenShift, which were just fine as long as the networks didn't collide with each other. Um, and since our uh, architecture is, is sold to our customers in a far more waterfall method, um, Dell is, is far more traditional that way. And we, we towards our customers, it's far more waterfall. We're not an agile software company yet. Um, the the PDFs and the documentation that I release um, is really bleeding edge stuff. So I put the GitHub shahs in our PDF to ensure that the um, any code uh, that are my customers grab from GitHub to run is actually the code that I've tested. And I have the SHA of the particular commit where I know things are good. And so my next release of the documentation and our next release of the OpenStack platform I know all my stuff is going to work because the SHAs are in there. As long as you copy paste those SHAs, um, your system will be exactly like mine. Um, the uh, uh, early in my testing, notice that my um, uh, all this great open source code that was uh, doing the deployment, all the, there was not a feature in the heat templates to indicate what's the pool ID of your OpenStack. Um, that you bought from, you bought a subscription from Red Hat. Uh, so I added a feature, and if we have time, it's a little hard for me to see how much time I have left. But I could even just take a quick walkthrough of uh, how to yeah. hack on this this. Uh, this yeah, you have you have plenty of time, so please please do. Okay. Um, let's have a look at it then. Do -do -do -do. I will share my terminal. Um, so here we are in the uh, on the director node, um, which does the which is the result of the undercloud deployment and then leads the overcloud deployment of OpenStack. And normally one kicks off a deployment of um, of the OpenShift on OpenStack product by running this heat stack create. And there's our open source solutions Dell, and these are the parameters files that one uses. Uh, that's the parameter file that uh, the end user modifies in order to kick off the deployment. Um, so let's have a quick look at it. And when I first joined the project, there was only um, only this value, only the. So that was great. That was my OpenShift license, but I couldn't indicate my OpenStack license to get access to the repositories that I needed. So I added uh, added this um, this variable here. Where does what did I have to change in order to enable them? Well, let's look at it um, the really easy way with our friend, <laughs> Grep. Um, the first file that's important is the, um, <clears throat> is the openshift.yaml. And I just, I went in and I opened, I checked out the openshift 
Yaml, and I saw that there was the RHN pool. I was like, I need another RHN pool. So I copied that structure and uh, changed its type from a string to a common delimited list to allow folks to add even more pools if they needed to, and really just went through and added those parameters. Um, the um, We'll see the code uh, in a minute, but it actually, um, there's a lot of duplication within uh, heat template files. They all have to know about each other's variables. Uh, there's a lot of um, testing for variables. There's a lot of uh, defaults for variables. And you just have to make sure that in each one of the features um, that heat is, imp that they're implemented in heat, that your um, your variable get ex gets expressed there. Um, <clears throat> lately in the project, there's been a a drying out. Uh, don't repeat yourself. And uh, I'm excited to see how dry we can actually get these files. But the 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 shell scripts themselves that these end up in um, are in these fragments. Uh, when the master server boots, um, there's this shell script which um, runs as the master virtual machine boots. Uh, it's the cloud init script. Uh, and these are um, functions to add to the cloud init script to, um, should be a repository in these unless they've recently been changed. in a little bit, so bear with me for just a second. No worries. Um, yeah, in the, uh, I was looking at the wrong one, master boot. Um, that's, there are um, some functions where it adds the repositories. It's been a little while <laughs> since yeah, I've just... looked at this stuff. There we go. Um, set extra repos is called. Um, I. Um, This has changed a lot since the last time I did it. Um, but it's really just hacking these shell scripts that get coalesced into one shell script that becomes the cloud init script that runs as the first thing that runs the first time a, a virtual machine is brought up and it, it updates the operating system. It pulls in uh, some client utilities from OpenStack um, and uh, that's basically how you add a feature um, um, oh, here exactly is my extra pool ID. This is the uh, this is the code right here. It is so simple to add um, to add more pool IDs and attach to them uh, because the the issue that I was seeing was I didn't have access to all of the OpenStack tools that the folks inside Red Hat or the folks who were using CentOS had access to. Uh, so it was a very simple change. Uh, just took took me an hour or two of, of work and and testing. And I was able to get the feature added really quickly. And the guys, uh, Jan and the other guys on the project, took my patch really quickly. I think might have cleaned it up a little bit. And I was able to start um, committing to the project, which was just wonderful. Really easy folks to work with. Um, 
let's make sure that's really all there is to creating that additional feature. Um, awesome. I go back to my presentation. Did you put up a uh, URL in your in your PowerPoint somewhere for where those technical documents are available? Um, they are not yet available on the Dell website. They are available through me. They are available through our uh, systems engineers, to our sales engineers. Um, we don't have a spot on our website where they're being published just yet. Um, I'm, we're, we're reconfiguring our tech center to have more content from the cloud team. The overall reference arch architecture is available there. Um, if you just go to, if I share my Firefox, I guess this one. Um, if you just go to Dell OpenStack, can you all see this? Yep, we can see it, yeah. Um, there are, um, in our learning library, here's the reference architecture. Here's the, the Red Hat reference architecture, and all of the further documentation is coming real soon, that it would be right up here. Okay. Um, I actually have to do some updates to the docs. Um, we don't have a spot yet for OpenShift uh, to put these docs on. Uh, we you consider might... it part of our OpenStack release. Cool. So when we when the video of this comes out, we'll put it on blogs.openstack openshift rather dot com, um, and hopefully we'll get some links there so that people can get a hold of that. Mm -hmm. And and we'll put your email address so you can get spammed. Oh great! <laughs> I love spam. No, seriously. Um, the let me switch back to my presentation. Um. So, like I said, step two, write your feature in the Bash scripts. Step three, watch your feature fail in OpenShift Ansible. Um, what happens is um, those Bash scripts come together to create um, the cloud init script that I said runs at the, the beginning, at the, at the first boot up of your VM and appropriate to the type of VM, whether it's infrastructure or the master node, uh, sorry, the master or the nodes of, open, of OpenShift. Um, and OpenShift Ansible itself is another really big project out on GitHub that Red Hat is spearheading to automate the sophisticated deployment of OpenShift on a variety of different infrastructures. Bare metal out on the AWS cloud or Google's cloud uh, or on top of uh OpenStack. The uh so this is a big project that's moving very quickly and my feature initially failed on OpenShift Ansible, but they are also so incredibly responsive that I was able to get my feature fixed in OpenShift Ansible within a day. Um there are also a few um habits that I picked up to to make debugging all of this stuff easier. Um, the way we set up the director um, is we, we have keys already set up, private keys and public keys, SSH authentication set up between um, the director node and all of the over cloud nodes. Um, so what I did was I took the that public key and I also put it on all the virtual machines uh, that I had direct access to. The architecture, if I switch back to my terminal, um, here I am on the director node. Uh, and if I look at my, um, uh, when I'm running in Nova, uh, I have, uh, let's look at the infrastructure server first. I have an infrastructure for server. Um, it's got a floating IP address and it's got an IP address on the fixed network. 
Um, little sidebar here that's very important. Um, the OpenShift on OpenStack deployment tool deploys two networks for you. It asks Neutron to create two networks. It creates a network that is only the core components of OpenShift and a second network that includes the um, the that also includes their infrastructure server. And you can see the difference right here where this master one virtual machine has one network, it has two networks, and it has three networks. Um, it has what they what we call the cluster network and the fixed network, and then a floating IP address from uh, from OpenStack that can route out to the world. Um, the infrastructure server, which is not a core component of OpenShift, has the floating IP and it has the fixed network, so it can communicate with the OpenShift cluster, but it does not have uh, an IP address on the cluster network. And the networking goes so far as to prohibit the nodes themselves, which are far behind the scenes, from having a floating IP address. So anybody who's on the uh, OpenStack, on any of the OpenStack undercloud, I'm sorry, any of the OpenStack um, overcloud boxes, the compute nodes or the, uh, or the controller nodes cannot SSH in directly to the workloads of their customers cannot cannot SSH into the OpenShift nodes where the pods are running. They can only get into the masters. So let's have a look at um, one of the masters and how just by this good <laughs> this practice of I, it, it got really frustrating um, for a while if the keys weren't in place. So I just dropped the keys in place and. Now I can SSH do this dot twenty address without the least concern. Um, um, I dropped my my key in place, and I can SSH into the um, the floating IP of the master server. And there I'm at master zero. And then if I need to get to one of my nodes, I dropped the key right here, the, the, um, the public key right there, and I'm able to SSH into a node that I wouldn't be able to get to otherwise, like uh, this. Um, which makes debugging much easier if I can just call journal control uh, from right there and see what my OpenShift is, is up to. Um, and it's clearly up to a lot because I have a few workloads running on it right now. Um, so that's the, the practice of, of whenever you deploy a, uh, an OpenShift cluster on top of OpenStack, it's going to be hard to get to the nodes. Drop your keys in place beforehand um, so you, you don't spend your life looking up key names uh, and having basically an awful time. Um, now, once you kick off the heat stack create, um, I timed it and I offer documentation of what log files you want to look at for how long to ensure the process is running correctly. Um, you may not want to go through all of this here and now. It's here in the presentation. It's also in the documentation that I released. It's, um, it's a further fleshing out of the documentation that's available on GitHub within the project. Um, in short form, it, there's over 20,000 Ansible plays that gets executed to ensure this is all set up properly. For the first 10 minutes, you're watching heat for the uh, the heat that the, the heat event list, which is just 
on the OpenStack level using the OpenStack API. But for the next 15 minutes, you're looking at the infrastructure VM and it's cloud in it. And as it prepares Ansible. And then for the next 10 minutes, you're watching, um, you have to log uh, into, um, well, no, for the next 10 minutes, you are watching uh, the, um, the OpenShift nodes get uh, created. You can log into each of them and watch their cloud init scripts. And sometimes things will fail in those cloud init scripts. And that's the only place where you're going to find those errors by logging into the virtual machine itself. And then for the last 30 minutes, you're, if you want to watch what's going on, you're logging into that infrastructure VM again and watching those Ansible log files. Uh, and that's generally where most of my debugging happens is watching those Ansible log files, uh, gripping for uh, failed amongst those uh, Ansible log files. All of this is documented in excruciating detail uh, in these three deployment guide, in these three technical guides, and the one into well, the two technical guides and one integration guide. Um, I thought if I had a little time, I would show y'all how um, how um, I could show you the uh, the OpenShift front end, my running containers, my deployed applications, uh, but also show you how CloudForms is giving visibility and uh, monitoring and even reporting to all of these resources. How am I doing on time? Well, you've got about 10 minutes, 12 minutes left, and uh, the questions, Sylvain and Jan and, uh, um, and Mark Lama are answering the questions in the chat. So I'd say, um, unless anyone objects, go on with the demo um, and we'll, we'll run, run over a little bit if we need to for Q&A. Okay. Um, the uh, one important thing I'd like to call out here that my boss keeps fetching about is the fact that open cloud open um no, sorry that cloudforms has access to everything and it looks really really dangerous that cloudforms has access to the management networks in order to log into the uh the director node into the compute hosts into the storage hosts and then log into all the virtual machines and I, I try to assuage his his concerns by saying, yeah, but we have role-based access control in uh, in CloudForms, so everything's okay. And we've only opened up these specific ports, and we've only opened up this one IP address having access to uh, other access other um, to these core parts of your infrastructure. Um, that should definitely be a different talk. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. The so let's have a peek at um oh there's the Windows. I have to access my um no I have to share that one. Um I have to access my stamp through a Bastion host. I have to access all my hardware through a Bastion host. Can you guys see uh, this CloudForms management engine screen here? Yes, we can now, yes. Great. Um, here we're looking at um, the over cloud nodes that have been deployed. Um, here you can see CloudForms 1. You can see the uh, these are all the virtual machines that are making up uh, all of OpenShift plus any others that I happen to launch, um, giving you quick at a glance status for how the machine is doing, what it's made up of. Um, it's saying, you know, this is running RHEL. It's an OpenShift, I'm sorry, it's an OpenStack VM. Uh, it's got, I don't remember what zero is, um, but that it's it's running. You could also take a look at different parts of the infrastructure. The first thing that you set up when you start CloudForms, other than CloudForms itself, is the infrastructure provider, which is, whoops. Which is to tell it that um, you'll be using OpenStack, and this is, I have nine nodes in my OpenStack 
uh, deployment that is um, three controllers, three storage nodes, and three compute nodes. And if we drill into this, we can see a summary of all those and all of the um, all of its nodes. I've done um, what they call smart state analysis, which is a fantastic feature of um, cloud forms, which goes in and does deep interrogation of even all the processes on these boxes. So if I look at one of the compute nodes, uh, we can see all of the services, all of the services we care about, whether or not they're running on the box and how they're configured. You can see this running Nova and Keystone and Horizon. Um, whether they're running the servers or the clients of these particular features of these yeah, of OpenStack. Then we can look at the virtual machines on this uh, on this particular host through relationships. It's running three VMs. It's running my CloudForms VM and it's running uh, when I OpenShift nodes. Here on my OpenShift node, um, we can see all the details of this particular OpenShift node. Also through um, the smart VM, uh, sorry, the uh, smart state analysis, which is called fleecing uh, to the developers, where um, what happens is CloudForms will take a snapshot of the running virtual machine, bring that snapshot onto the CloudForms machine and mount that drive, uh, mount the, the image and interrogate the image for all the processes and all the software that's been, been deployed on that. Um, really doing a very deep inspection, but out of band and not impacting the performance uh, of that virtual machine. Um, then within this virtual machine, we have uh, OpenShift deployed. And I believe somewhere right here, we can see where OpenShift is deployed. Actually, we can't. So in the overcloud, we could see my nine nodes, uh, each of which have been interrogated. But if we go to uh, compute containers, we can then see an overview of what um, each one of my OpenShift deployments is, do is doing. And right now, I only have one deployment of OpenShift, one provider. It has five nodes. That would be the, the, uh, uh, the masters and the, uh, and the, um, the nodes. So I have two masters and three nodes. And each of those has um, a certain amount of um, pods and services that have been uh, configured by OpenShift. Yeah. Uh, I've got a few bunch of uh, a bunch of applications um, running, trying to get Hawkular. There's some there's some uh, certificate issues to get the the really deep performance information out of Hawkular is is one of my to do's um, this is the very basics of what cloud forms offers you it offers you so much more uh, reporting and chargeback uh, a lot more um, multi-tenancy and um, custom dashboards than you than you really could ever imagine in order to control and report off of what's going on um, so, the, um, this, so Judd, um, we've only got five minutes left, so I'm going to see. Um, is this a good jumping off point maybe to um, yeah. to see if there's any questions out there in the land of um, chat here? There was a little bit of chatter about Ansible Tower and whether or not you were using that. And I. That's a no, not using a, Ansible Tower. Good. So, so that's 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 how we answered it. So. Um, and let's see if anyone else has got questions here. I think, and I'm going to unblock um, 
Sylvain and Jan, if they wanted to add anything into this, because I know they were two of the, the key folks that you worked with, um, but they have themselves muted, so. Yeah, they were both incredibly, incredibly helpful. There you go. Sylvain, um, Babo, and um, Jan, you're both, Pro Pro Provaznik, I think, you're both unmuted now if you want to add anything in there. And um, mm -hmm. it also, we have um, on the phone with us here, someone um, is asking, what kind of monitoring solution are you running? Um, and is that where your Hocular stuff is coming into play? The monitoring we're doing um, is, is only cloud forms. You can set up alerts for performance uh, through cloud forms, but we haven't invested a lot of time and energy in in monitoring right now. It's all been about deployment and reliable deployment. Okay. We'll see if anyone has uh, Mark. I have un Mark Lamarine. I've also unmuted you as well. So if you want to add anything in here, we've we've done we've seen a couple of different reference architectures for Open Open Shift on OpenStack, and Mark was one of the folks that um, talked in an earlier podcast that I'll include the link in in doing some of this work, but you've definitely um, done a whole lot more work. I'm waiting to see um, all that technical documentation come online because I think that's gonna be incredibly useful for the community and um, to get started. So we'll have to see how we can incorporate that um, down the line. The other thing that happened just the other day, um, there's a blog post, um, Jeremy Eater's been doing some work on performance tuning, um, around using the CNCF's cluster. Um, and I'm gonna push Dell, if you haven't, guys haven't joined the, the Cloud Native Foundation yet, you really ought to. I'm sure EMC is at some level, so, but you need to get more of them, because they have um, some hardware that they're making available as well, though so you have your own hardware, which is wonderful. But there's a, a great blog post about doing that, um, that just came out deploying a thousand, and I dropped the, the URL in there. And, um, Judd has very nicely offered to chair an OpenShift on OpenStack um, special interest group for the OpenShift mm -hmm. Commons. So um, he's, coercion is my, my game here. Um, there are a lot of people in the OpenShift community that are um, also part of the OpenStack community, so I think it's a natural to do that. Um, and we'll try and launch that SIG in the next coming weeks, probably after Labor Day, after Reddit comes back from holidays. Um, and then... Um, we are also going to be hosting on November 7th in Seattle, um, and Judd has also been coerced coming there, um, what we're calling the first OpenShift Commons gathering. It's going to be co-located with KubeCon. Um, you can register today. Um, now, if you go to the OpenShift Commons um, site and do slash gathering, you should be able to, to find all the details there. And we've got uh, all of the SIG groups will be meeting there over the lunch breaks, and it's really much more of a networking event, so you can meet your peers and have face-to-face -face time with them. So we hope you all will join us there for that as well. Um, and if, Judd, you can throw your final slide up with your contact right. information in there, right. so people sure. who need to get a hold of you can and um, do. And we will try okay. and... Um, yeah. Not... Wait. Sorry. Uh, Jan, Jan did you? Well, yeah, uh, just a minor note about the CNCF, uh, CNCF testing. Uh, our project was actually uh, involved in this testing, and we uh, we had a part of this uh, of these resources uh, available for testing OpenShift on OpenStack, and uh, we did quite a successful scale up uh, testing we were able to scale up up to 100 nodes with dc templates which was the primary goal for this uh, this project so well this is uh, just a myth about uh, the jeremy's book and yep. also uh, thanks jet for the awesome presentation it was pretty cool thank you for the code <laughs> And it's a, a lot of yeah. a lot of a lot of collaboration went on to make all of this happen. So, um, and we're really thrilled with the work that Judd's been doing over the past three years 
keeping up to all of our revisions of OpenShift. And so you've got a slide up here about what your future plans are. Why don't you go through that, Jed? Yeah, with OpenShift 3.3 coming out real soon with, is it Kubernetes 1.3 or 1.4? 1.3. Um, yeah, we're expecting um, to be able to advertise support of a lot more storage backends, especially. Um, and I want to use our labs to test storage performance. We got a lot of storage gear, and we got a lot of folks who are really good at testing performance that way. And I, I want to collaborate more with Red Hat in order to, to show some real numbers there. Um, want to do some .NET workload examples, we find a lot of our customers are very interested in being able to deploy .NET into such a flexible and reliable infrastructure. We'll have to hook um, you up with, with the click to cloud guys who have got all of that worked out. Um, and that they'll definitely be interested in doing that with you. Mm -hmm. And we will, uh, we at Dell will be documenting in further detail the details of expanding <clears throat> our OpenStack uh, cloud, because right now we just give you specifications, but no documentation and actually how to go about it um, in, in a way that covers all three, uh, all three racks and all the networking. So as they expand that part of the documentation, I'm going to expand my documentation uh, for, uh, to match our reference architecture. Um, I'd like to try to get to, these are sort of nice to haves now, the, um, the deeper OpenStack integration, especially with authentication, that my uh, my colleagues, my product managers keep asking for, you know, one account for a, from OpenStack and OpenShift. Um, and we're also hearing a lot from our customers the need for um, the um, the network segmentation for tenants and the billing and chargeback. They they really want to be able to do the chargeback within their organization, or if they're a managed services provider, um, like the big telcos, they want to be able to offer bills. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've already asked my questions. So there's a little Dilbert for everybody. Um, and then this is how to, how to reach me. Awesome. And thank you so much. Well, thank it's you. Too. a lot of fun. It's been it's been a, a wonderful collaboration. So Jan and Sylvain, thank you very much for your efforts, and Mark Lamarine as well. Um, in the past, has done a lot of the the heavy lifting and and contributing the code to this to make this all happen. So it's much appreciated. Again, we're going to be all gathering together on November seventh for the OpenShift Commons gathering. So um, please do join us for that day, and um, I will make sure that Jed's there and available and. And you can have your own OpenShift on OpenStack um, breakout room and um, go into even more deep dives in, in person on that. So looking forward to supplying the beer for that and making that happen um, in Seattle for you all. So again, thanks, well, thank Judd. You, Dan.